In this film, the second of a short series, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to Dr. Jen Curtin, a specialist in ME-CFS and associated structural disorders. In the first film, link here, we asked what craniocervical instability, the Chiari malformation and tethered cord conditions were, and why they might be associated with long COVID and ME-CFS. In this film, we're going to discuss the symptoms and what the red or green flags might be to determine whether you might or might not be suffering from one of them. Hope you find it helpful. If you could explain in lay terms how <clears throat> these malformations give rise to symptoms, say such as fatigue or PEM or dysautonomia. You know, we don't have this fully confirmed, but there are theories about why this may happen. So for instance, I'm going to pull up this Chiari chart again here. And the brainstem controls a lot of your autonomic functioning. So your breathing, some of your alertness and awareness, um, it's your heart rate, a lot of the things that you don't have to think about doing most of the time to, that keep you alive. It's like all the, all of the life support systems on a spaceship. Those are the things you're not actively controlling every day but they keep the, everyone there alive. Um, a lot of that is coming from your brainstem. And so when your brainstem gets in the case of like CCI or Chiari, that's where the cerebellum's pushing that brainstem up against a bony little protrusion right there, it's called the, the Bayesian. It's kinking it over and there's pressure here. So if you can imagine, it's kind of like sticking a bone butter knife into the front of your brainstem. Anytime you compress neurological tissue, it's not happy. Uh, it's not going to function well. And there may be a positional component to it because where our head connects to our upper neck, there's no discs, the kind of jelly donut type discs between your vertebrae. We don't have them between the skull and between the first vertebrae and the second. And that's actually great because it allows us to really rotate our head and really get good range of motion. So if you know, if you're basically like way back in evolutionary times, you're trying to see something coming at you from far away, you can do that. Um, however, it also makes that particular area, it's all held together by ligaments and muscles. So in a sense, it's a vulnerable area. Um, there's a lot of very important neurological and blood vessel structures and CSF that all goes through right there. And yet it's very highly mobile. And um, also there isn't, you know, it's, it's all ligaments and, and small muscles that kind of hold that together. So it's a very, very vulnerable point. So if you're an ME-CFS or a long COVID patient, and you're wondering if this might be an issue for you, are there any particular flags in terms of symptoms that might suggest that there could be some structural issues? And what should they do next? How do you go about getting a diagnosis? So essentially here, the, a lot of these symptoms overlap between both conditions, but some of the ones we kind of hear a lot, and these have been voiced by certain surgeons who are very, um, who see a lot of these cases, there's a sensation of like the bobblehead that people talk about. And it's this sense that you're like one of those bobblehead toys where your head almost feels like it's kind of loose on your neck, like it's just bobbling around. Um, the other thing people sometimes describe is this sense of just really extreme head heaviness. Like they feel like their head is just sinking down on their neck and they can't like hold their head up. You may see people, people constantly propping their head up when they're talking to you, like holding it up or they're leaning against a pillow and their head's being held up. Um, those are little signs that I kind of look for when I'm talking to someone like, are you holding your head up? Um, headaches, neck pain. Um, the headaches oftentimes, especially when, you know, you think of that dream being plugged, um, those headaches can be worsened by things like coughing, laughing, sneezing, bearing down, having a bowel movement, because all of those things increase pressure inside of your head temporarily and can kind of worsen the problem either above what its baseline level is, or someone may have headaches only when those things happen. Um, you can have problems with swallowing. Some people have like a hoarse voice. They can't swallow. They choke sometimes even to the point of gagging and throwing up. Um, you can have numbness and tingling in your arms and legs, hands and feet, unsteady gait. So difficulty walking, like you don't have good balance. Um, you can also have problems with coordination and fine motor skills in your hands. 
So finding it really hard to write or draw, if you're really good at like drawing before, um, those are all things that can show up. There's other symptoms that are a little bit less common. So ringing in the ears, um, you can have, uh, there's also vision changes that can happen. Um, there's a whole list of symptoms. And sometimes what I've seen too is dysautonomia POTS, where when you go from lying down to standing, your heart rate can shoot up quite a bit, 30 beats a minute or more. And um, that's in adults, it's higher in kids. And um, sometimes what we'll do is we'll have people actually with their physical therapist go into traction, put a little traction collar on and then repeat the orthostatic vitals. And sometimes we'll see that their pot significantly improves. And um, so the thought there, we don't know exactly why that's the case, but we just suspect that possibly their, their brainstem is either being kinked or there's pressure. And when you relieve that, their autonomic system can function better. Can I just check? Um, I mean, there's not a lot of understanding about MECFS, long COVID, amongst clinicians in general, never mind these rather specialized aspects of it. How can patients go about getting the right help? So this is a bit of a challenging one. Um, one thing that would actually be a great resource, there's a fantastic, um, basically expert set of guidance from physical therapists that was published pretty recently. So I don't know if you can see my slide here, but this one right here, this is great. Uh, this is basically almost like a guidance for as a physical therapist, like if you have a patient coming into you, how do you work this up? How do you do this? What steps do you start with? And what kind of order do you go in? And what are the red flag symptoms you need to watch for? So this is actually a wonderful paper that you can actually take with you to your physical therapist, to your primary care doctor or whatnot, um, for them to have a little bit more guidance on this. Because this is an area that most doctors, unless you're a neurosurgeon or, or a neurologist, you probably didn't really learn about most of this. You've like heard of it, but it wasn't something that you were taught in depth about or ever thought you would be managing in your clinic. So um, this is a really great paper. I'd highly recommend it. There are also a lot of very good lectures. Um, the I think it's called the Bobby Jones Syringomyelia and Chiari Foundation. They have really excellent lectures and those can possibly be shared um, with a provider for them to kind of get more um, background knowledge on it kind of before they see you. This is a set of symptoms that are, um, so this first column I actually cut it off is um, kind of more common and then slightly less common symptoms. Um, and it continues over here. So more common, less common for um, cranial cervical instability. Um, this is again from that, that paper that I had mentioned before. That's really good. Is there a test that you can do to rule a CCI or Chiari issue out? For example, you know, if you can do a handstand or if you can move your head in a certain way, or do you know what I mean? Is there something that, that if you can do that, suggests that you probably don't have a problem there? Because if you did have a problem, there's no way you'd be able to do it. So I don't know if there's anything like really strict on that, but I did watch one of the neurosurgeons like see somebody and they're like, if you're lying down and you kind of like, can almost do the worm, but backwards, what's, like where you're, you're the jetting worm? your head forward, <laughs> that right. old 80s dance move. <laughs> right. So but, um, look on YouTube you can, for the worm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're like lying on a, on a bed or a table or something, and for you to get up, you kind of do this one where you're like, like that, and you're, you're jutting your head forward and then moving your body down. Most people with CCI aren't going to do that. Um, they would be a lot more ginger with their neck. They'd probably be trying to roll to the side. They'd probably put their hands and stuff behind their neck or support it. They're not going to be, or let's say you're sitting upright and you're holding your head at a very kind of precarious angle. And you do that often where you're just like, okay, yeah, you know, you're able to just hold your head out there or you're like weightlifting or something with your neck. <laughs> And tolerating that, you probably don't have this problem um, for craniocervical instability. Now, for Chiari, because the neck isn't stable, sometimes you can have Chiari and be completely asymptomatic from it. It really depends on how far those tonsils are coming down into the brainstem and how much of the flow is blocked around it. 
But I would say for craniocervical instability, if you're able to really move your neck around and, you know, move it fast and quickly and hard, and you don't really have any symptoms or problems, I wouldn't think that that would be your, your issue. In the next film in the series, we discuss the investigations required to work up the condition and do a deep dive on the treatments as well as what the prognosis might be. One final quick word, if you didn't know, I have written a book with Dr. Dr. Professor Danny Altman. It's available as an ebook, audiobook, and hard copy. If you feel like you'd like to have one resource that brings together everything that we've learned about long COVID in the last few years into just one singular, definitive, accessible place, then maybe the book might be of interest. Uh, if you have a look on Amazon, you can see other people seem to like it, so maybe you will too. Link is in the description. Look after yourselves. Until next time.